I depend on you for the sun to rise for my sleep at night. I depend on you. Yes, I depend on you. Good morning and welcome. So good to see you. Those of you that are in this space and those following along online, welcome. So good to have you today. We've come here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Raise your hand if you're ready. 
We're going to lift up some great songs to him. Uh, we're going to use our instruments, our, our voices, and our, our guitars, and our drums. And, but we're gonna, it's all going to come from our heart. Lord, we praise you. We lift up your name, only your name. Only you are worthy. Come on in if you're in the gathering area. Stand together and let's worship him. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied in hearing your love. No, there's nothing. Is the God of a valley? If there's not a place, your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better.
never let us go. followers of Jesus, or at least we're curious about God and His Son. You know, if you believe in Jesus and you have Him in His life, then we have the Holy Spirit with us at all times. And He equips us and helps us to live a God-honoring life. But it's a little more intentional to live a Spirit-filled life. And we're going to hear about that today and in the weeks to come. And what we're doing today is intentional. We come together we want to be in his presence. We want to seek his face. We want to hear him and his word. He wants to instruct us by his spirit, and we've come to receive that instruction. Raise your hand if you want to hear from God today. Yes, we do. Pray with me. Father, we, we pray today that 
your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and that you would convict us and challenge us and change us that we would be transformed to think and act like your son Jesus what a privilege it is we bow before you with all that we can understand we need your spirit to even help us to move in the right direction this morning we open all our hearts doors and windows for you to come in shine your light make us better make us like your son Jesus in your name we pray amen you may be seated continue in a spirit of prayer as you hear this beautiful song you 
Welcome to Trinity. We're so happy to have you today. If you're a guest, please fill out that Connect card that's in your bulletin this morning. Uh, drop it off at our Connect desk on your way out. We would love to meet you and give you a free gift and help you get connected. It was so great to have everybody back at our midweek ministries on Wednesday nights here this week after Christmas. It was great seeing everybody's faces back here. Uh, just a quick reminder though, if you're joining us for dinner, you can sign up for dinner in our app and at our website, or you can stop out here at the Connect desk after church and uh, sign up. Let us know how many of you are coming each week so that we have enough food for you. We can't wait for midweek this year. Parents and grandparents, we do not want you to miss out on the Parenting Never Ends Conference. It's here at Trinity on February 11th. Get signed up. We're going to have dinner together. We're going to hear from Paul David Tripp. Uh, it's a video conference. It's from 5 to 8 p.m. And also, if you got to bring your kids, that's awesome, too, because we have some great programming for them. They're going to be making mini pizzas and, I don't know, doing some crazy stuff down the hall. We want you here. Come learn um, a biblical perspective on parenting from, from infancy all the way up to adulthood. We can't wait to see you. Get signed up. Go to the Connect Desk and do that today. Our Trinity Chili Cook-Off is coming back on February 26th. We are going to have all kinds of chilies laid out for you to come and enjoy. And all of your donations um, during that event will go towards helping support our teens and our adults headed to Guatemala this summer. Come enjoy spicy, uh, traditional white chilies. We want to fill your bellies after service um, that day on February 26th. If you can uh, cook us some awesome chilies, we would love that too. You can find the sign up for that at our events page. Put it on your calendars February 26th. Trinity 101 is coming up on February 5th. It's coming soon. So if you would like to know more about what it means to be a member here at Trinity Church, uh, come on out that day. We will give you lunch and uh, come learn about uh, the EPC, about how we run, about what we believe and what it looks like to be an active member here at Trinity. You can come that day. Go sign up at our events page. We can't wait to see you. If you'd like to give toward any of these great ministries here at Trinity, you can do that very easily uh, by going to our app or our website, or you can give um, in our giving boxes on your way out today in the gathering spaces. Thank you for your generosity. Now we're going to get into a brand new sermon series uh, called Fresh Fruit, Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit. Let's get growing. Let's do this. Well, good morning. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, my name is Mark. And I'm glad that you're here. Uh, welcome to you in the uh, box seats up front. Welcome to you in the cheap seats at the back. A little shout out. And uh, welcome to you who are online with us. Uh, I've seen several new faces, some faces I haven't seen for a while. So I'm glad we're here together. Uh, before we jump into God's Word, uh, I want to ask you a question as we begin thinking about fruit. How many of you like fruit? Just raise your hand. I think it's almost universal. Most of us like fruit in one way or another. I need a little bit of help, a little bit of participation as we start out. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question and, and shout out, not everybody all at once, but shout out some answers because I, I want to hear them and it's hard for me to hear up here. So uh, what is your favorite fruit? Think of a favorite fruit. Somebody over here? Grapefruit, pears, strawberries. That's enough over here. What about this one? Anything? Mangoes and raspberries, grapefruit, oranges, blueberries, grapes, apples, watermelon. We love fruit. We love all sorts of fruit. Now, why do you love fruit? Here's another question. Why do you love fruit? It's sweet. It's got sugar in it. It's good for you. Yeah, whatever. Uh, what? It What? nourishes you. Yeah. So we love fruit. We like all sorts of fruit. I think probably if I had to pick one of my favorite fruits, if not the favorite, it's kind of seasonal, but I love blueberries. 
Uh, Denise bought me a whole case of blueberries here at Costco, and so I had blueberries this morning. My game day meal is, uh, water, is uh, watermelon. It's, it's oatmeal with some blueberries in it and uh, some natural peanut butter, crunchy, not creamy, and also some Michigan honey. I mix that together every Sunday before I preach. That's my game day meal. Love that this morning, but I think maybe the, one of the reasons I love blueberries is I have this great memory of growing up in my Grandma Smith made blueberry pie for lots of different holidays, and she would make some amazing homemade crust, and she'd put the blueberries in there. And uh, this, this is from Chile. Uh, we, ha- we grew up in the Thumb, and you found blueberries in Sandusky. Uh, Sandusky. Uh, so, so we just loved blueberries. And she, my, one of the things I love is my grandma would put so much sugar in the pie. Um, I think sugar is my second favorite fruit. And, and so she would put so much sugar in, like cups and cups of sugar into a pie so that when she would bake the pie, it would settle down at the bottom and you'd have this nice layer of crust and then you'd have a crystallized layer of, blue, of sugar and then there's a little bit of blueberry, whatever, I threw that apart. So, but I love blueberries uh, because of that. So, but here's what I want you to keep in mind because I love blueberries with cream on top with some sugar. I love blueberries with ice cream. Picture your favorite fruit, the one that you were just thinking of, and in your mind, whether you love that fruit by itself on a great summer day and you're just juicy, whatever, or you love it in a pie, or you love it in a cake, or you love it with ice cream, whatever it is, picture that fruit and, and know this. When God wanted us to think about what he has for us in life, the kind of life that he wants for us, he desires for us, The biggest and most common metaphor that God used in the Bible about the life that he has for us is fruit. He wants a fruitful life. That kind of feeling that you had, that you experienced, that's in your mind right now, that's the kind of life that God wants for you. He wants our lives to be fruitful. He wants our impact on others to be like biting into that juicy fruit. He wants our character to be that way. He wants our words to be that way, all for his glory and for our good. So let me ask you this question then, Uh, a couple of questions actually, Uh, just to kind of think through this and and begin to open up the topic of fruit. Uh, Two questions. When you think about your life, about how you're doing, about your everyday walk around life, would the word fruitful be a good description? This isn't meant to make you feel guilty. I'm just curious, like when you think about your family, when you think about your relationships at work, when you think about your speech, when you think about what's going on inside of you, is fruitful the word that comes to your mind? When you think about your friendships, when you think about your ministry, uh, is, is the word fruitful the sort of thing that you think, wow, that's, my life is really fruitful? Or would you maybe, on the other hand, regrettably say that when you think about your life and, and the way that it's playing out, you would describe it with words like, like uh, fruitless or sour or, or even rotten. Is it fruitful or is it something else? That's one question just to think about. The second question is, uh, if it's true that God wants our lives to be fruitful, how does a person become fruitful? How does that happen? What's the process like? What role do we play? What role does God play? How does that happen? What's the purpose of it? What's the why? What does that look like? And what's, the, what's it look like if it's done well? What does fruitfulness look like? Those are the kind of questions that we're going to explore in this series. And as we do that, I want us to turn to a great passage in the New Testament in Galatians. Paul uh, speaks to us from this passage. It was written to a a church in Galatia, and uh, it's written to us, though, as well. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. We'll have some words up on the screen. But as we look at this passage, we're beginning this series called Fresh Fruit, Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit, which you're going to see in this passage. And we're going to take a number of weeks to think about why does God use this particular image of fruit? And what does that mean for us? How does that play itself out in our life? How does, how does it help us understand what God wants to do in us and through us? And then, uh, of course, as we study, we never do this just for information. We're not trying to just learn more. We want God to change us, to transform us, to make us more like Jesus. And so well, let's read this passage. Uh, I'll read it for you. Follow along. Galatians five sixteen. It says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. 
so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And then he lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this, and that's an ongoing lifestyle of those things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's the word of the Lord. It's actually really important. This passage that Paul gives to us today is one of the most important passages for us to understand about the Christian life. It helps maybe as we walk through this together, it might help us to understand like why is it so hard to grow as a Christian? Why is it so hard sometimes to follow Jesus even when I want to? Why is it that it seems like such a slow process? What's going on and what's God got in store for me? If we don't understand this passage, we won't understand any of those things. And so we're going to dive in and we're just going to look at several different learnings from this. Uh, I'll, I'll call them two tensions in this passage. Two tensions and then two, I couldn't think of a better phrase. I'm going to call them life hacks. The life hack, you're familiar with that, it's something that's helpful to us. This actually is more than just helpful. This is like essential Christian life kind of stuff. So two tensions and then two awesomes. Uh, I don't know, just make up a thing. Here's the first tension we see in this passage right here, is that you already, as a Christian, have the fruit of the Spirit in you, but you also grow in them, and you grow into them. Pastor Tim Keller uh, points out in a sermon, he did almost 30 years ago, and I listened to it, a lot of his sermon is in this one. He points out that there's nothing more awesome and exciting, amazing, to dig into the Bible and to see what it actually says about what God has already done for us. What God has already put into us. Because when we start talking about love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, we're not talking about these, these strange things that are imported into us, that are kind of brought in from the outside because we don't have any of them. That somehow you are so unloving, you're so unpeaceful, you're so unkind, that God's got to give those to you. That, that, that's not the idea. The idea is that God has already put those into us. The Bible is going to tell us to grow up in our salvation. Let me give you an illustration of this. You ever known uh, that 13-year-old boy, uh, and if this is you, I'm not talking about you. If that 13-year-old boy, he's 5'6", he still like hasn't hit his growth spurt, but his feet are size 14. You've been there, or maybe you know people like that. And you know, you know that uh, it's not going to be that way forever. Maybe they're still walking around and, and you feel for the guy. He's still got a high voice, just his peach fuzz, and, and, and his feet are far bigger than the rest of his body. And so what do we say? We say he's going to grow into it. He's going to grow into his feet. His, 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 the rest of his whole body had the, all the chromosomes, all the DNA is already there. It just is going to grow into that. And that's the idea that I want to get across is that somehow, like, like Peter says in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, we need to grow up in our salvation. And what that means is that these astonishing things that the Bible said should be part of our life as Christians, there should be true of us, are in a sense already true of us. That somehow we already have the fruit of the Spirit, but we grow into that. Think about an acorn for a second. When we were living in Brighton, we had a massive uh, oak tree in front of our house before everyone went to seminary and, and we, every year we'd be raking leaves and raking leaves and raking leaves in the fall. But it's, it's hard to even imagine, hard to fathom that that massive, like over 100 feet tall, probably, I don't even know, just huge, huge tree with so many leaves, so many acorns, all that came from one acorn. That at some point back in time, somebody planted that acorn or a bird flew and dropped it in. I don't even know how it got there. But somehow that oak tree got planted from a single acorn. And from that single acorn, came the whole oak tree, came acorn after acorn after acorn. And if you took those acorns and you started planting those all over, like you could populate a whole galaxy full of planets with oak trees from that one single acorn. 
that everything for all those oak trees and for that particular one, everything was there from the very beginning of its life cycle. And in the same way, you and I have already been given the divine nature. You already have not just the potential, but in some small seed form even, inevitably you have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. It's there. And so instead of saying to yourself, oh, I'll never get there. I'll never be a mature Christian like that. The question is, when am I going to grow up? When am I going to allow the Spirit to grow those things in me? You don't say, I'll never get there. I'll never get there. And that, that, that's maybe the tragedy for those of us who are at ground zero, it feels like, for so long, is it's all there. But the process of growth is really gradual. It takes a lifetime. And we'll begin talking about how that process works even today, but we'll, over the course of this series, look each week at how this this love grows into us. Like, what what is the love that Christians have the potential to experience and to know? What is that? What is the joy that God has given to us that, that we can see grow in our lives? What does that look like? What does that feel like? What's experience like? What's peace like? What's patience? We're going to look at each of those. As we look at this amazing passage in Galatians 5.22 that we just read, 5.22 and 23, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. The tension, you already have it, but it's going to grow. Second tension is this. Christians have two natures, and they're in conflict. Uh, Listen to verse 16. So back up in this passage. He says this, listen to the tension, listen to the two natures, the conflict that's there. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. And then he'll say, so be led by the Spirit. And verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. And then he lists those and he says, don't live this way. And then verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is this. And then he lists those fruit. And he says, live by the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. So it seems like in one sense, it's really simple. Uh, You can live in the flesh or you can live in the Spirit. You can know if you live in the flesh, here's the result of that. Here's what's going to come. Here's the outcome. Here's the fruit of that, if you will. Here's the works of the flesh. And then here's the works, the outcome of the Spirit, of living in the Spirit. So the The Bible teaches us we each have two natures as Christians. The flesh, the sinful nature. When Paul uses the word flesh, almost always he's using not our skin. It's not like he's talking about our bodies. It's not our bodies and our spirit fight against each other. Flesh is our nature. It's bent against God. It's the whole person. It's our body, will, our spirit, our mind, our emotions, all those things. It's the inclination of a life against God. That's what he calls the flesh. And he says, and we've got to listen carefully to this, this is so important. When we become a Christian, that sinful nature doesn't just go away. We don't lose the struggle. It's just that the struggle changes. When you become a Christian, uh, there's a new battle that happens. There's still a battle. Before you became a Christian, and I'll just look, look at it this way, uh, there was a battle that was going on, there was a struggle. You may not even have realized it, but your struggle was against God. Your struggle was against God because when we are not following God, when we don't want Him in our life, the battle is going on that we want to do everything that we can to not live under God's control, to not give the lordship of our life over to God. We want to live our life our own way. We want to do what we want to do. This is the selfish ambition, all the things that are described in there. This is the kind of life, and there's a struggle against God. There's a battle that's going on against God. You can make progress in it. It feels like it can go well for a time, but living that life in that battle is, is like, uh, because all human beings are, are made to worship God. We're made to center our life on God. And so when we live in this realm, our life doesn't work. It's like pulling a wagon uh, without wheels. You can pull it, you can yank on it, and depending on how strong you are, how much the wagon weighs, the friction, everything else, you can pull it along, but you keep doing that, and pretty soon it starts starts to fall off. It starts to break. It starts to disintegrate because that's not the way the wagon was meant to be pulled. It's the same with our life. 
it can go well for a while, but it doesn't work. Our life begins to fall apart emotionally, mentally, all sorts of different things feel like they're breaking because that's not the way, that's the fight. When you become a Christian, when you, there's a peace with God. We experience that. It's tangible. It's real. A terrific amount of peace. But the minute you become a Christian, into your life, into your heart, that used to be completely about you and maybe your family and success and everything else, into your heart comes this foreign object, the Holy Spirit, a spirit that gives us joy and that gives us peace and that gives us a desire to walk with God, a desire to follow Him, a desire to love this, this Jesus who saved us. It's an a, a idea of holiness, a yearning after God. And so now it's a battle. So there's two sides of you if you're a follower of Jesus. This is why it can be so hard for us. There's a side that wants to live for ourselves, that wants to just keep doing what we want to do, keep doing the things that we feel like are right for us. And then there's the spirit in us that's battling with us that says, do this and follow God and flourish and and love God that way. So there's a fight that shows up. Author John White says the Christian is one who's known not only for his inner peace, but for inner warfare. It's just a different kind of warfare. The war has moved to a different place. And the old fight... This is a bad fight. This fight with God is a fight that you need to lose. Because God wants to win. He wants to be your God. He wants the best for you. This fight, the fight with the sinful nature, is a battle that he wants you to win. And that you've got to win. And that he wants to help you to win. It's a, it's a battle that gives you strength. It's a battle that when you fight it well, it actually strengthens you and, and grows you. It's kind of like the difference between two different kinds of of running, if you will. There's a kind of running that wears you out and a kind of running that strengthens you. You're running, and I'm running one way. It's a running like we wake up in the morning and it feels like a race. It feels like I've got to get out of bed. I've got my to-dos. I race through breakfast. I race through the goodbyes. I race to the office or I race upstairs to the office, wherever it is. I do that. I race through meetings. I race through all the stuff that happens after work, I race to kids' games and this and that, and I race and I race and I race, and you're just exhausted. Anybody? Lots of us. We're just exhausted. That's a race that wears us down. You can also wake up and want to run and go to the gym and work out, and, and you get a workout program, and you get a membership at the gym, and you actually start to go, which is a miracle in itself, you start to go and you start to you get on the treadmill and you're running and you run for a while and you get somebody that knows what they're doing, they help you out. And that running is a running that tires you out, but it actually strengthens you. So there's two different kinds of running. One battles, if you will. One that wears you out and one that strengthens you. The battle against God is a guy, battle that you need to lose that will wear you out. But it's an important battle, each one of us. But here's the thing. There are people that sit here in this room, people in our churches that don't have any fight. There's no battle that's going on. You don't see that warring. You don't see that conflict. And maybe that is true in your case. You just see, like, I I feel vaguely anxious. I feel like um, I don't know what's going on. I'm kind of limping through my Christian life. A little bit unhappy. There's no fight. Maybe it's because you haven't declared a side. Um, do you want to fight? Here's how you get a fight in the Christian life. Here's how you see this battle work itself out. If you want to fight with your old nature, just commit to God today. I want to read through the Bible uh, for 30 minutes a day. I want to just spend 30 minutes every day for the next 30 days with God. I'm just going to commit to doing that. You'll have a battle on your hands. You've done that. Maybe some of you, you start out the year like, I'm going to read through the whole Bible this year. And January 5th, you're like, how come I haven't done that for four days? <laughs> right? We have that battle. All of us have experienced that at different times. We want to do the right thing. We want to spend time with God. But as soon as we start to do that, as soon as we sit down and we open up our Bible, all of a sudden it feels like the world, the flesh, and the devil are just attacking. It feels like everything in the universe, all of my schedule comes in, all the distractions, all the reasons. My bed feels so warm in the morning all of a sudden. I don't want to get up. All of those things happen. We have this battle when we want to spend time with God. So if you want to battle actually get into it like that. 
uh, there is a battle that will happen, and, and God wants us to win it. So, how do we win the battle? How do we win the battle? How do we develop the fruit of the Spirit in our life? Here's the two life hacks, and, and I hate to even call them that because they're lifetime things. It's not a shortcut. There's no shortcuts to growing in the fruit of the Spirit. This takes years. It takes a lifetime. We won't be able to do it in 11 weeks. You'll just get started, but I want us to get started. How do we grow? It's important to know, Paul doesn't say about these nine attributes of the life of Christ, he doesn't call them uh, the fruit of your own efforts. He doesn't say, this is the fruit of how hard you work. He calls these the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit has already given you, even in seed form, love, joy, peace, patience. He's already done that for you. And it's actually the role of the Holy Spirit in your life and Him alone, by God's grace, to grow the fruit of the Spirit in you. But we play a role. We play actually a really significant role. What is that role? Number one, abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. John 15, Jesus will say this in verse 1 and 5. I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, remain is a Greek word meno. It's a word that's translated in some translations as abide, stay with, remain in. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, if you're not abiding in me, if you're not remaining in me, you can do nothing. So there's something about, whatever this looks like, there's something about abiding with Jesus, remaining in Jesus, that he is the source of strength for us, that he is the source of life, of sustenance, of nourishment. Just like a branch connected to a vine. He says, I'm the vine. If you're the branch, you've got to be connected. You're connected. You're staying with me. You're feeding from me. I am giving you fruit. If you don't connect with me, your fruit will be negligible. It'll be non-existence. You'll be barren, all those sorts of things. Uh, But if you abide with Jesus, you'll grow. The fruit begins to be manifested. I'm reading a wonderful little book. Uh, It's challenging and convicting, but it's wonderful. From Andrew Murray, he wrote it. He was a South African guy in the early 1800s. He wrote a book called Abide in Christ. And He's talking about the fact that Jesus offers and invites us to come to him and follow him. And we do that. That's what it means to initiate that relationship with Jesus. But he says we miss the boat because we don't go far enough and we don't understand what that means. Listen to these words. He says, over time, so many people who have come to Jesus complain of disappointment that their expectations were not realized. The love and joy of your first meeting with your Savior, instead of deepening, has become faint and feeble. And they wonder, and maybe this is our experience. Maybe this will be helpful. They wonder why their experience of salvation has not been a fuller one. And then he says something that's actually really convicting, really challenging. He says the answer is simple. You wandered from him. The blessings, he he elaborates on that because it's it's really, really beautiful. The blessings he bestows are all connected with his come to me and are only to be enjoyed in close fellowship with himself. You either did not fully understand or did not rightly remember that the call meant come to me to stay with me. Come to me to stay with me. It turns out when we come to Jesus and stay with Jesus, Jesus begins to rub off on us. We become more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit in our life are basically the communicable attributes of God rubbing off on us. Now, how many of you are familiar with the language of communicable attributes of God? You have to read theology books. I know there's a few of you in here like, yeah, I know exactly what that is. Uh, theologians will talk about the different character qualities of God and what, what are the, they, they put it in two categories, incommunicable and communicable. Incommunicable categories of God are things that are true of God alone. Like for instance, his uh, omnipresence. He's with, he's everywhere at the same time all at once. And, and it's fun to think about what that actually means because we think 
maybe if God's everywhere all at once, it's kind of like if you have a canister and it's filled with a gas of some sort and it's got a bunch of molecules in it. You take the lid off and all of a sudden it begins to diffuse and that number of molecules just spreads out and so it begins to go everywhere, but it's a little bit of this gas and all over the place. And we think maybe that's what God being everywhere is like. There's a little bit of God everywhere. And theologians say, no, what actually is going on is that God is fully present every single place in the universe and beyond. God is fully God, fully everywhere. And we just can't even wrap our heads around that. And that's something that will never be true of us. Even when we're looking at um, our Revelation series, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven and, and eternity. We talked about having resurrection bodies when Jesus comes back, as followers of Jesus, we have resurrection bodies, and, and maybe they'll be like Jesus' body. We'll be able to walk through walls or, or appear or travel fast, really play. But we'll never be omnipresent. We'll never be everywhere all at the same time. Only God can do that. That's the incommunicable attributes of God. The communicable attributes of God are things like His love, His patience, His kindness, His goodness. They're things that, that we can actually be like. In fact, this is what's really cool. Communicable means you can catch it, right? Uh, what's a communicable disease? COVID, right? We know way too much about this right now. We know what a communicable disease is. It's a disease that when you're near somebody that has this thing, you get it. If you're at home most of the time, who knows? It was weird. Sometimes you could be in a house with people that have it and you don't get it. But most of the time, a communicable disease, it's flu, it's colds, it's, it's cold, whatever. If you're near somebody, spend a lot of time with somebody, you catch that thing. That's really cool to think about that. What's so amazing about the Bible is the Bible tells us that there are attributes of God that you can catch. If you spend time with God, if you're gazing into his eyes, if you're seeing God for all that he is and all of his glory, if you're willing to open up his word, for instance. So when you're spending time with God, you're opening up his word. And instead of uh, just re opening up the Bible and saying, and this is the idea of abiding. I can, I can read the Bible lots of different ways. I can read the Bible by saying, all right, this is January, whatever, 15th something. I, I'm supposed to read four chapters today because I want to read through the Bible this year. I read through my four chapters, check, close it, and then go on with the rest of my day. That's one way to read the Bible. A different way to read the Bible is to soak it in, to allow the truth of the Bible to just wash over us, to sit with a word or a phrase or even a longer section, but just allow God to teach us something more about himself. You read about God's majesty, and you don't think, oh, that's awesome. I can put that in the category of God's attributes that are incommunicable, and I think it that way. Or I can read about God's forgiveness and I think, well, that's, that's cool. Uh, God does forgive and I'm thankful that he forgave me. Check, end of story. Abiding with God means sitting and allowing the majesty of God to just soak in to my soul, to imagine God's beauty and his size and his glory and all that he's done. And somehow that changes me. Think about patience for a second. Like as we get into the fruit of the Spirit, we'll do this along the way, but where's patience come from? How do you develop patience in your life? I love patience in other people. Uh, <laughs> patience is this beautiful thing. So, so I sit, I'm sitting and I'm thinking about the patience of God. Think of how patient was God with the people of the Old Testament that time and time again, he'd give them promises, he'd, he'd rescue them through the Red Sea, He'd give them manna. He'd do all sorts of things. And then the second that he finishes, practically, they turn around and they whine, they complain, they mumble. He's so patient. How patient was he with Jonah when he gave Jonah the mission of going to the Ninevites and proclaiming the glory of God, the, the gospel, the salvation of God. And Jonah, Jonah hated it. He didn't even want God to do it. He was like, I hope that all these people burn. I hope you judge them, God. And then God saves them. God forgives them. And Jonah, like he just whines about it. How patient was God with Jonah? How patient is God with me? With all of my ups and downs, with all, all of my insecurities, all of my foibles, all of my sin, how patient is God with me? And you meditate on that, you soak on that. And, and pretty soon, to the extent that I grasp how patient God is with me, 
I begin subtly to become more patient with other people. This is how it works. It's not a direct line that I read the Bible and all of a sudden I'm more patient, but there's this process that the Spirit works in us as we abide with Christ that He begins that process. So, so the next time somebody does something that's really frustrating to me, maybe it's not quite as frustrating the next time. And it's by degrees. It's a slow, slow process. But that's what abiding with Christ means. So it's a slow process. It goes over time. And each week, as we walk through this series, we'll take one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit and we'll just dissect it. We'll define it. We'll talk about uh, its opposite, like what's the rotten fruit that can come in our life? What's the wax fruit? That's, that's the stuff that we can be manufactured through the fleshly nature. We'll talk about the daily littles. We'll talk about, like, what do we do? What are some things each day that we can do abiding with Christ in order to grow and see the Spirit grow in that? Um, abide with Christ. Second life hack is this one. How do you develop the fruit of the Spirit? That's the question. Paul says, um, the way to do that is to keep in step with the Spirit. This is like 10 sermons condensed into two minutes. Verse 18, here's what he says. He uses different language. He says, walk by the Spirit. If you're led by the Spirit, since we live by the Spirit, verse 25, let's keep in step with the Spirit. This idea of allowing the Spirit to work in our life, listening to the Spirit. So keeping in step with the Spirit means trusting in and following the Spirit's lead. Trusting in and following the Spirit's lead in our life. To discover the Spirit's leading, we need to abide with Christ. So it's all related. What the Bible's saying is basically this. We can live every single day, even as followers of Jesus, we can live operating out of the flesh or operating by listening to the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. We can do that, and it's a battle. That's where the battle comes from. Uh, it's almost as if, and, and uh, if you're a tech person, forgive me, I'll get this wrong. If you're not a tech person, you might not understand. Um, it's almost as if we have two operating systems that are going in our life all the time. You have Windows and you have an Apple iOS. And I won't tell you which is the spirit and which is the flesh. That's up to you. I have no stake in that game. Uh, but one, we're operating with two operating systems. Computers don't work that way. You have to choose one or the other, I think, most of the time. But in this case, it's almost as if we still have, which one is this? This is Windows. Okay, I'll go with that. Somebody said it. I don't care. This is Windows. This is Apple, iOS. And, and simultaneously, things go on in our life, and we're trying to figure out which one of these will we listen to? Which one of these will we operate in? And the goal of a Christian is to not operate in this one, but to keep in step with this one. But they're always going on. They're always working simultaneously. Let me get some really practical examples, I hope, uh, of what that means. Because we want to lean into the spirit operating system. We'll access the spirit drive, if you will. I don't know. Go, go on. Uh, so how do we walk with the spirit? Let's say that you're given a project at work to do. Whatever it is. And, and you're supposed to succeed at this project. We can operate in two different ways. And I know that our motives are always mixed. They're all, these are always spinning at the same time, and, and our motives are always some mixture of these. But here's how it could work. On the one hand, I could say to myself, I want to succeed at this project because I need to prove myself. I want to get a bigger raise. I want to get a promotion. I want to show to these people that I'm actually better than what they think. I'm going to show them that I am somebody. I'm going to show them that I am good. I'm going to try to increase my own leverage in their life or whatever. And so I'm going to do it this way. And so if somebody comes and they tried to keep me from doing that and I'm operating on this system, I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be upset. I'm going to be competitive. I'm going to do things to make them look bad, to make me look good. We, you know what this is like. We operate on this system. To operate in the system of the Spirit, to walk with the Spirit, to listen with the Spirit is to say something like this. I don't need to be accepted by them. I don't need to prove myself. God has called me his child. I am his child and I am loved by him full stop. He is the one who made me. He's the one who 
wired me. He's the one who gives me eternal life. He's the one, all those things. And so I can do this project and I can succeed this project simply because God has given me a gift and I can work at that and enjoy it and I can bless people with it. And if there's stuff that happens in a positive result, that's fine and that's good, but I don't need that to prove who I am. That maybe is a difference between those two kind of operating systems. Let's put it, another example, put it in the realm of relationship. Sometimes we try to lo- do something because we want to be loved. We want to prove that we are lovable. And so oftentimes in a relationship, maybe you're not married, you're dating somebody, and, and you just desperately want to show to yourself there's something in you that drives you. I just want to be loved. And so you're willing to go beyond where you know you should go physically with that person. You, you move way past different boundaries because you want so much to have that person love you. And you feel like if I don't do this, if I don't give in to that, if I don't do this something, that I won't be loved and I'll never be able to be loved. Nobody will ever love me. If I, so we just have that as opposed to saying, mm, God has loved me beyond belief, loved me so much that he gave me eternal life, that he died for me, that he's walking with me, that he is with me each day. I don't need to do something to show that I am lovable because I am loved. So here's the problem in our life. The challenge in our life is all of the time, all the decisions that we make, and there are thousands of examples that I could give and you could give about different decisions that you make, different things that are going on in your life. All of the time, the motives are mixed. And so the job, our job is really is to say, how can I recognize when I'm operating here and try more to lean into the Spirit, to access this drive? And at the end of the day, you'll know that you did, it was mixed every single day for the rest of our life until we die. But as time goes on, we realize, wow, today more often than not, I was living over here. And the, the beauty is that God knows that's true of us. He knows that that battle's going on. And so the Spirit is uh, very gentle with us. And he forgives and he gives grace and he knows. I mean, you're in the battle and sometimes you'll win a battle. Sometimes you're going to lose a battle. But I'm, I'm going to keep growing you to be more like Jesus. I'm going to keep growing you in the fruit of the Spirit. And he keeps bringing you back and he keeps walking with you. And that's what he wants for you. And that's what I want for you. So as we go through this series, here's a way to stop today and just to say, all right, um, we're going to learn about each of the fruit of the Spirit. It's going to be awesome. I want you to keep coming back. We're going to give you, we didn't get a chance to get it printed. Alpha Graphics was late on this. If you, if you're, we love Alpha Graphics, but they just, they fail. it was a fail on this one, I'm just going to say. We have a great journal that the team put together. It's going to be about this size. Uh, with each week of our series, just one, one fruit of the Spirit per week, we'll give you a chance to take notes uh, each week. We'll give you some definitions, some, some identifiers of the fruit and the opposite, the fake fruit, the wax fruit, the rotten fruit. We'll give you, um, we want you to use this. So we're just giving these to you. We want you to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. So next week we'll have them and uh, we'll have them down, downloadable online too. Even today probably we could do that. Here's the question. This, let's close this way. I want you to celebrate. What is it, when you look at your own life, where would you say that God has already grown the fruit of his Spirit in you? that you'd say, this is kind of a, a sweet spot for me. I've done this several times this week in different settings, and this was actually fun, and you might be able to do this. If you're um, here with somebody else, if you're here with a spouse, with a, a, a significant other, maybe even a parent uh, or child, ask them to tell you what fruit of the Spirit they see in you. It's really awesome. As I've done that with different groups, it's amazing and it's just fun to see the smiles because it's cool to be able to affirm in somebody else and to be affirmed by somebody else in what area have you seen God work in your life. So pick a, one or two areas and just celebrate those. And have a party. Do whatever it is. Just celebrate the fact God has been at work in your life. It's not just a little seed anymore. It's a sapling or it's a big tree or it's a forest that God has grown uh, in this area. And, and it tends to be that each of these will kind of grow in concert with one another. But you'll see in yourself some areas that are really strong. That's one. Second, 
for your own self, not for the other person, what's the growth area that you have? What would you say in your heart of hearts, this one, I'm not so awesome at this one. Patience is not my strong suit. And then just ask God to help you grow in that fruit of the Spirit over these next weeks to grow in patience, to understand what it means to begin abiding with Christ and and keeping in step with the Spirit. And again, that language, we'll get more familiar with it as we go in this series. And maybe your fruit is toward the end of the list of nine things. We'll get there. So be patient with us. It turns out that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> so, uh, Father, today, as we, uh, as we close this, it's amazing just to hear Paul's heart, to hear him describe, and he does this even in Romans, his own battle. The fact that you've instilled in us, you've placed in us uh, the fruit of your Spirit, that each one of us, if we're followers of Jesus, already have love and already have a desire for peace and patience. We have joy. We have a desire to follow you. We have a desire to walk with you. And yet, we also recognize, and this passage helps us to understand why, we battle with that. Each and every day, it feels like we're battling with ourselves, and we want to do good, but we don't do good. The things that we want to do, we don't. The things we don't want to do, we do. All the things that Paul experienced. And yet, we know true that your spirit is with us and you forgive and you care about us and your hope for us is that we would grow more like Christ that we would be transformed into his image that we would experience for real a growing sense of of love and joy and peace and patience and so we pray that you would help us to learn what it means to abide with you we pray that you would help us to keep in step with your spirit we pray that by the time we finish this series we'll have launched in each of our lives, a new growth path. And we pray that you would do that in the power of your spirit and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together as we continue in a spirit of prayer. We sing this song to our Lord. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good you are good
So if you're here this morning and maybe uh, you're battling with God, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're still battling with God, I gave you, because if one of your biggest reasons for not trusting God is that there are so many hypocrites in the church. Christians don't do what they say they're supposed to do. I just gave you the, exa- the reason why. Is that you're fighting against God. It's a battle that you never can win. It's a battle that you don't want to win. If you trust Jesus, it doesn't mean your life is going to get easier. It means there's a battle for life. A battle for more and more of the Spirit's love to fill your heart. More and more of the Spirit's joy to fill your heart. More and more of the Spirit's kindness and goodness to fill your heart. That's a battle I want to keep fighting for the rest of my life. That's the good battle, Paul calls it. If you're, not, if you're still battling with God, I'd love to talk with you. Help you know what it looks like to trust in Jesus. For all of us today, I'd like to give a benediction, a blessing. If you want to raise your hands, lift your eyes, lift your hearts. May you go today in the grace and the peace of Jesus. May you go in the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness and the gentleness and the faithfulness and the self-control of Jesus. Go with that in your heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a great day, everybody.
There is no higher name, Jesus, you are.